Um, welcome everybody, my name is Michael Bank. I'm from Germany, came all the way from Germany. Um, I'm working for NetApp these days. That's a storage company that builds huge storage clusters. Um, but they also uh, try to have their storage in the cloud and they have a cloud operations division now. And InstaCluster, um, where I'm working at, got acquired by them. So we are now part of their cloud operations division. And before that, I used to work for Credativ, which was a German open source consultancy and support company that got sold to InstaCluster. So that's without changing companies. I've now been through uh, three different companies. And um, today I'm going to talk about Patroni and Patroni deployment patterns. Um, I'm, I have been working with Patroni for the last couple of years, besides other things. And I'm also the Debian developer or Debian maintainer of the Patroni packages. Apart from that, I'm could also be said that I'm a Patroni contributor. Um, I'm a Postgres contributor. That's a bit easier because there's a um, dedicated contributor team that figures out who's a contributor, who's a major contributor, and, and so on. For Patroni, that doesn't exist. But we used to have a Patroni contributor meeting last year at the German Postgres conference, and I was invited. And I'm organizing one this year, so I probably can call myself Patroni contributor these days. All right. So what is Patroni? Patroni is, they say, a template. But in general, it's, uh, it's a high availability solution for Postgres. So if you can't read it, just come a bit closer. I uploaded the slides um, to the, thank you. Now it's in here, probably. This one's slow. So you want to quickly switch it? Just have to switch the batteries. One second. Right, you see? Test, test. OK, still working. OK. So um, yeah, Patroni is a high availability solution for Postgres. And I tend to think that high availability is complicated. So first off, if you are able to just do regular Postgres replication, and you have somebody on call, and you don't need five nines or whatever um, of, of uptime, maybe it's better to not use high availability, automatic failover, because sometimes there is something, there's some jitter in the network, and the timeouts are not configured right. And then your high availability solution will in initiate a failover. And then that means that all the connections and transactions are rolled back. And uh, there is a downtime for at least a few seconds. It's, it's really difficult to have a failover with um, almost zero downtime. So if you can avoid it, maybe that's the better solution, I have to say, up front. But a lot of, a lot of organization, a lot of companies do not have 24-7 on, on staff, um, or they don't have staff that are able uh, to, to wake up and make a manual failover in five minutes, because um, that's also pretty difficult. You have to diagnose a bit what's going on and, and hit the right things. So automatic failover solutions certainly have um, a place. Now, Postgres itself has replication, but it does not provide high availability. There are some primitives, like uh, streaming replication. You can have asynchronous or synchronous streaming replication. Um, standby cloning is pretty easy with PG, back, PG base backup these days. It's basically just the one um, command thing to um, clone a standby and then a second command to, to just start it. Um, you have a hot standby, which means you can run read queries on the standbys for, for read scaling. And you can promote a standby, basically. That's, that's it. So the important part here, even if you do a switch over, is you need to promote. First, you have to demote the old 
primary, which there is actually no demote command so far in, in Postgres, you have to shut it down and then start it up as a standby again. And then you have to promote the other one, and that initiates a, a switchover. Um, and so all this kind of um, orchestration for a failover and switchovers that, has, that needs to be done by a high availability solution, and then things like leader selection, split brain avoidance, quorum enforcement and, and uh, service failover is also an important part of it. So what is there? Um, these are the three high availability solutions that are there besides Petroni and have been there for a while. So maybe the longest standing is Pacemaker. That's a general high availability solution initiated by uh, Red Hat and SUSE back in the days. Uh, it's pretty old. There is a specific Postgres um, agent called PAF, Postgres Automatic Failover. Um, Pacemaker is pretty good in the sense that it can enforce quorum and, and do a so-called stoneth, shoot the other node in the head, where uh, if, if one node realizes that the other one is down, it um, forcibly turns it off via iDRAG or whatever um, operate or a management system there is, or, or VMware stuff. Um, one, one problem or a couple of problems with, with Pacemaker in the past, we had several customers using them, um, is that switchovers are not very trivial. It's, it's not very, basically you kind of tell one no, run the resource you have to be on the other no, uh, re, um, node and then you have to clean it up. It's, it's not very obvious. And also it's a bit difficult to tune the timeouts correctly. But one thing maybe that Pacemaker still has that, that others lack is that it's possible, in, in, at least in principle, to do some storage switch over there. Like you, know, you have maybe a cold standby in a, a second machine where Postgres is not running, and you just switch the storage over if the first machine is down and just start it up again there. That is also not super ideal usually because that means you have to do crash recovery on, uh, after the failover. That might take a bit, but it might be a good solution in, in your environment, I don't know. And then there's Rep Manager, which was basically, I guess this is the oldest Postgres-specific replication solution, you could say. And as the name says, it was a replication manager. It, it's, it's not, it wasn't designed as a high availability solution. It was designed as a replication manager. And then later on, they tacked the rep manager D daemon for automatic failover on top of it. And then they added a witness node. And um, it's a bit clunky. You have to basically uh, add your own shell scripts, I believe, still in order to uh, do fencing and, and, and rollbacks and stuff. So it's not, it's not the best. It looks a bit brittle. And also, after the acquisition, I mean, it was developed by a second quadrant. And after Enterprise DB acquired second quadrant, it's now a bit unclear how, what, the, what the upstream commitment really is. So basically, the guy who's doing most of the rep manager commits, he was at a Petroni contributor meeting last year as well. So it seems to be, they seem to be moving to Petroni as well. So it's still working, and it's a good solution for manual, manual replication management. But personally, we've seen a lot of trouble with it, so I wouldn't recommend it. And then third, this PG Auto failover. Um, that was initiated by, I think, Citus before it got acquired by Microsoft. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe it was after they got acquired. Um, it's a bit similar to Rep Manager in the sense that both of them only have things running on the Postgres nodes and nothing external. Like Pacemaker has this total, this CoroSync, um, which is, you could say, it's external to Postgres uh, communication layer, which does quorum. Um, but Rep Manager and PG Auto Failover just have extensions or databases or an agent on the Postgres nodes. However, PG Auto Failover has, I mean, it got a designed like that, so they have a, a pretty good state machine. They know like what happens if this node goes down, what happens with the other nodes. So, so this is actually pretty, at least theoretically, thought out. There's a monitor node for this kind of thing. But uh, I also think the future is a bit unclear. I mean, it, it's being developed. I think it's now an independent project. Maybe it's just feature complete, but 
it also hasn't really seen a lot of uptake, I think. So personally, I don't know nobody who's running it. We also didn't um, have any new customers, for example, that are running already. Is anybody running PG Auto Fail over in here, maybe? No, okay. Well, maybe I'm asking the other way around then. Who's running Patroni here? At least one person. Who's running Pacemaker still? No, any other HA rep manager? Okay. So maybe 80% do not run any high availability so far, which again, could be, could be okay. Right, so those are the three um, existing solutions other than Postgres. Any, any other solution that people might be running? Maybe, I mean, cloud native Postgres maybe on, on Kubernetes. That's maybe certainly something that's, that's nowadays a possibility. Okay, so give you an overview of Petroni. Um, I'll give you an overview, I'll explain the architecture a bit and the, the operating concepts and then I'll give a deployment um, overview, well, like how, how could you deploy it and, and in the end I'll talk a bit about some of the issues you could have with parts of it. So Petroni, um, it's you could say cloud native project in the sense that it was originally done for containers. Um, it, it's working in containers and, and that's where, where they um, designed it for, let's say. Uh, it's, it's actually a fork of Compose Governor, which was before. Right, there's, there is one other project called Stolon, um, which has also been, has a kind of a similar design to Petroni but I'm, I haven't seen it being very well developed either. I believe Compose is now owned by IBM, so ironically, uh, the grandfather of Petroni is now IBM, if you would think that. Um, it's written in Python, and it has a very Postgres-like license. You can do whatever you want, no copyright assignments, no open core, nothing. It's uh, just there for you to use. The project is basically, well, it, it was initiated at Zalando. Um, they took Compose Governor and then made a fork out of it. Uh, I don't think he's, uh, I believe there's maybe one or two variables left that, that haven't been changed since then, but in general, that's, that's basically uh, how it worked. Um, and they're still using it, I guess. They're a big Postgres user. I mean, if, if you don't know Zalando, it's basically a very small version of Amazon in Germany. Um, yeah, they, they run their production databases on Postgres and, and um, they're using Patroni. So there were two people initially doing this, uh, Alexander Kukushkin and Alexei Kluikin. hope I pronounced it correct. Now, uh, Alexei, he, he moved on, uh, he's, he's now at Timescale and he hasn't been involved with Patroni that much for over the last couple of years. Alexander Kukushkin, he's still the main developer, I would say, but he's now at Microsoft. So there's one new person, um, Polina Bungina, um, so a lady who's, who's working still at Zalando and she's one of the co-maintainers of, of uh, Patroni. So she got involved after Alexei left. So they are co they're the co-maintainers now, uh, Polina and, and Alexander. So the major features, um, it's an agent it runs on your instances, it configures replication, it enables switch over and basically autopilots Postgres in this bot pattern that you hear in these cloud native things. And then the, the important part is that it uses an external or usually external distributed configuration store, so called DCS, where the cluster state is being written to. So it's not using Postgres as a, as a database to, to keep the cluster state, there's an external key value store, basically. Um, and this is used both for leader election or in order to implement leader election, split brain warnings, but also con um, cluster configuration or Postgres configuration, if you want. And then on top of that, it offers a REST API that um, its own CLI can use, but you can also use yourself um, for health checks uh, configuration changes, all kind of things for status. There's a Prometheus metrics endpoint that can use. There's a, no, I don't think there is an exporter for that. It's just a, a metrics endpoint that you can just use. Um, 
as I mentioned, Alexander Kukushkin is now at Microsoft, so I think one of the big parts was adding CITUS support to, to that, so it now under, it supports CITUS, that is um, multi-scale, um, scale-out um, sharded Postgres. You can, you can operate that with Petroni now. And then optionally, you can use it with HA proxy. There's, there's pretty robust HTTP um, checks for the, on the REST API that you can use in order to set up um, load balancing. Um, so you can always, so the load balancer will always point to the, to the primary even after switch over or failover. Uh, you can use HA, uh, HA proxy, but others work as well. And then um, there's a connected project called VIP Manager that has VIP service endpoint management. But I'll get to that in a bit, I think. So what are the deployment options for Petroni? Um, it's being used in containers a lot. There's uh, original Spilo or Spilo, I don't know, um, fat container image by Zalando, which basically bundles Petroni, Postgres, so it basically has Petroni, all the, version, all the major versions of Postgres that are supported, plus a lot of the extensions, plus, I believe, backup uh, in, in one big Docker image, and then you can just deploy and, and run uh, in Docker or in Kubernetes. Um, this is also maintained by Polina. I think there was a bit of a maintenance um, lack for a while, but she's, she's now on it again. There are releases. And then there's the Crunchy Container Suite, which I don't think is a fork. It's just like there are several other people, or maybe you could say every company that does their own Kubernetes operator probably also has some kind of underlying uh, container of it. So um, the Cybertech PG um, container is, is just used by their operator. And then for Crunchy, I guess it's similar. And then you have a couple of Kubernetes operators. So I think every major Postgres Kubernetes operator except Cloud Native PG, which is, which actually was, a, there was a time scale um, state of Postgres uh, thing where, where they asked people lots of questions, a survey, sorry, and, and it seemed like Cloud Native PG is actually the, the most popular Postgres operator, but they are not using Petroni, they're using Kubernetes primitives, and it's, it's a Cloud Native um, Computing Foundation project now. Maybe that's why it's so popular, um, but it's founded by EnterpriseDB. But everything else, so there is a, the Zalando operator. That was the original one. And then um, Cybertech forked it, so they have their own one, maybe for branding reasons. Um, Crunchy wrote their own Postgres operator based on Petroni. And then Percona forked the Crunchy operator. Um, to implement some, some new features, I guess. And there's also the uh, Ongress Stackgress, which I believe is also its own development. And um, you can put it, of course, you can use it on bare metal, just Python pip install. It's, it's a pretty easy, it just installs all those dependencies. And there are Linux distribution packages, um, which uh, well, I, I maintain for Debian, but there's also some by Devrim from, for RPM packages. That's uh, one of the blog posts I wrote a while ago, how we integrated it. So it was a bit, as it, as it was written for containers, uh, it took a bit of massaging or like talking to the maintainers to actually get it working on Linux distributions, but it's working pretty well these days. Right. By the way, if there's any questions, you can ask them anytime. So the architecture. It looks a bit like this. Um, you have the distribution configuration store that's down there in green, which is kind of abstract at this point. It's just a key value store. And then you have the Petroni service, which maintains and operates Postgres. And then you have some routing um, in, in, the, in the top uh, where you, you route the client um, configuration, uh, connection attempts. We are a middleware, or we are a virtual IP, or we are client-based failover. Now, the distributed configuration store. It's, there are several implementations. Um, I think if you run it yourself at CD, either the version two or the version three API is the most popular these days, but for example, uh, my company, we have a managed Postgres platform, and um, they, uh, they, they had um, Kafka there first, and so Kafka needed Zookeeper, so they run it with Zookeeper, which is one of the uh, options as well, because they already had it running as a service there. Um, 
then console is another one, but I'm not sure about the state of console because I think it's a HashiCorp project and um, it's not, I haven't heard so much about it lately, so I'm not sure how well it works. Of course, you can run it with the Kubernetes API as well. And then there's a, a Python Raft uh, implementation called PySync object, which basically means you can just run it as part of the Petroni process. But it's a bit deprecated, unfortunately, because uh, the, the Petroni maintainers say that it's very difficult to debug if, it's there, if there's a problem. And there's no, not a lot of insight in it, so they deprecated it. I believe it works in general, but it's just, I mean, it's already not so great if etcd breaks. You have to be an etcd admin as well. I mean, this is maybe the one big downside of Petroni is that now you're not only just a Postgres DBA, but you have to also maybe care about etcd if you have to run it yourself, and, and this PySync object thing means that you, are, you have to debug it there, so. The, generally, the DCS uses the Raft consensus algorithm. That means that uh, you have at least three nodes, and there's a quorum between the nodes, and every change to the cluster state or every key value store change is, is using the Raft alg consensus algorithm with which makes sure that there is only one source of truth and everybody else is on the same page. Um, so the key changes are done via um, atomic compare and swap operations. And then you have um, automatically expiring keys with a time to live and, and watches to, to make it, uh, yeah, to implement the whole thing. Which is, so the main thing about the whole is the split brain avoidance. So you have um, quorum via DCS. And then the primary or the leader of the cluster periodically updates as a so-called leader key in the DCS with a time to live. So usually that's uh, 30 seconds, and he updates it every 10 seconds. And if then, for a while, um, the leader key expires because the primary is no longer there, there's a new leader election. And then fencing might be a bit problematic, but uh, it works in generally like this, that if there's a um, if the primary detects, it cannot update the DCS, and it's not in the so-called failsafe mode, which I get to in a minute, then it will demote itself automatically in order to make sure that there is no split brain scenario. Um, in the failsafe mode, it will just check whether all the other nodes are still there, and if, if it's just the DCS that is down, um, it, it goes on. And in the other way to, to have um, Fencing is you can have a watchdog device locally, uh, if you're on a on physical server, I guess, and uh, the watchdog can then shut down the node if, if it's unresponsive, which I haven't seen really used that much in production, but I think it's a useful concept. So there are, there are three loops and time, timeouts in Petroni that are important, and that's the time to live. I just mentioned the default, I think, is 30 seconds. That's uh, how long the, the leader key is is valid or is active in seconds. And then there's the so-called loop wait timeout, which means that every 10 seconds, Petroni wakes up, checks whether it's still following somebody or whether it's, it can update the leader key and, and does, a, does a main loop, so to say, um, and then goes to sleep again. And, uh, and then there's a retry timeout, 10 seconds, um, that, is, that it waits to, um, to reach DCS if it's not reachable. So how, do, how does the leader race work? So let's assume that, um, right, so, so Petroni 1 is the leader at this point. Um, that's, that's written here in the, as a leader key and as a time to live of 30 seconds. And Petroni 2 and 3, they have a watch on this key uh, in the DCS, which means that as, as soon as there's a, there's a change there, they, they get notified by the DCS. So, it up, so Petroni 1 does a, an update with a new time to live, and that, that works. So what happens next? Well, that's, that's the steady state, let's say. But if then Petroni 1, for example, goes down, then they're still having the watch. And for now, the leader key is still active. But as soon as the, t the time to live exp um, expires, they get a notification from the DCS that the leader expired as true. And then what they, next do, what they do next is they check. So Petroni 3 checks all the other Petroni nodes. They run a get Petroni or a rest 
call on, on the Petroni endpoint and see what happens. They will get a timeout from Petroni 1 and they'll get a transaction log position from each other. And they compare that and, and usually that's, uh, there's, a, there's a variable which says uh, you're not eligible for a leader race if your transaction log delay is, is longer than X megabytes. But if both of them are in that, uh, in that thing, then they will both do a leader race trying to update the leader key, create it new with their own name, and then only one of them, due to this um, raft algorithm, only one of them will be able to actually get this update through. And in this case, it will be um, Petroni 3, and Petroni 2 gets a failure back. So now that's the new leader, and Petroni 2 has a watch on the leader thing again. And the first one needs to be rebuilt. So it has to be restarted, maybe it can be re reacquired, maybe it has to be reinitialized, or in case of Kubernetes, it needs to be, the pod has to be recreated, I guess. Now, just a few operation concepts before I get to the deployment patterns. The, the most important thing about, or let's say most important, if, you, if, you're, not, if you're not running a totally autopilot in, in Kubernetes, is a, the CLI is called Petroni Control. And it um, gives you this list uh, here where you can see uh, which node is the leader, who are the replicas. Um, and, and also if the replicas are actually streaming, which means that they're in the, in the right, correct uh, configuration, which timeline they're on. So if the timelines are differing here, that means there might be some problem with the replication and also the replication lag here. But it can also be used for other things uh, like a show config. You can edit config it, which will drop you into your editor and then you can ch do some configuration changes. And then afterwards they are getting applied automatically to all the nodes. You can also do a switch over or a planned restart here if you, for example, you're, you're um, installing a maintenance release. Right. Another thing that's important is client failover. So if you have two or three or more Petroni clusters, obviously the, the client needs to connect to the right leader. Um, and also, if there, of course, if there is switch or a failover. So as I mentioned, HA proxy can do that. It could monitor the REST API endpoint and check whether that works. Um, we have some information here. So, so by the way, I tried to upload the slides to the conference system, but I, they haven't shown up yet, but I certainly will try again if you want the slides. Otherwise, you can also just approach me after the talk. I can send it to you. Right, and the other one is VIP Manager. It's, it's, a, it's a project that basically runs as a service on, on the local node, and it gets configured to check the DCS, and it only works with etcd or console um, for the local node state. So if the local node is a leader, it will configure uh, VIP. And uh, if the local node is no longer the leader, it will deconfigure the VIP. Now, why is that a different um, agent or, or service? Is that because in order to configure or deconfigure VIP, you need to have administrative access. And Petroni runs as a Postgres user usually who is not allowed to configure an IP address, whereas VIP manager runs as root um, generally. So the, this, is, this is needed. The, the main problem I see nowadays with VIP manager is that it's very aggressive in deconfiguring an IP address if it cannot reach um, the DCS. And if there is some trouble with your DCS, uh, like etcd went down for some reason or uh, something else, then VIP manager will very quickly demote your, um, well, it, it will deconfigure the, the service IP, which basically means that the service is down. And especially, I mentioned earlier that there's this failsafe mode now in Patroni, where Patroni itself can keep on running, even if the DCS is not available. If you run it together with VIP manager, it doesn't help much because it, VIP manager brought down the, the VIP. So maybe the best option, I think, or better option is to use client-based failover if that's possible. So every, for a couple of years now, you can just specify several hosts um, for a Postgres general um, connection string. So all the libpq-based um, drivers can do that. And you can just say target session attrips primary, and then it will automatically connect to one of those or the one of those that is the primary right now. And for JDBC, that has been even longer the case. Um, it, it's just called bits different, like target server type. 
only very, very old versions of PGJDPC cannot. So it depends a bit if your application allows that, if it just has a string that you can use. I think with PHP it might be a bit problematic because it might just want one host or it doesn't allow you to add these options. Um, but in general, if you, if you just have one connection string, maybe that's the easiest way to do it. Right. And then there's configuration text. I'll just get over this because it's getting a bit long in the tooth. It's basically you can have a local tag on, on, on an, in the configuration for each node if you want to have it a special meaning. For example, it shouldn't be failed over. Um, it shouldn't, it shouldn't um, be part of read load balancing for some reason. So if you have a topology where one of the nodes is different to the others, you might want to, to do it this way. Okay, then just one few words to replication modes. So in general, or by default, Petroni uses the general asynchronous physical replication. Um, it can do synchronous replication as well, if you want, and then it has two different modes. Um, it has a synchronous mode, and it has a synchronous strict mode. So the strict mode, so basically the, the question with synchronous replication is always, um, what do you do if the primary uh, sorry, if one of the, if the standby is down. If the sync standby is down, there's this big problem in general Postgres replication that the primary will then wait for the standby forever to actually commit a transaction and it will never continue. So the primary is also down. Um, so what Petroni does in this case, if, uh, well, if, if there is no other synchronous uh, or no other standbys available to become synchronous standby, it will just fall back to as asynchronous re replication, so yeah, the, the whole thing can continue to work. But then you don't have synchronous replication anymore. The other option is strict synchronous replication, where it will really then um, stop the replication rather than going to asynchronous, which might be the right thing to do for a bank, for example, that never want to lose any transactions or somebody else who's very, um, for that, would be very problematic for them. So you can configure both of them. And that's, for example, also what Pacemaker, Puff, uh, is able to do if, the, if you want. Um, you can, it falls back automatically to asynchronous replication. Then you can also have cascading replication possible. We had this replicate from thing, but also that's a bit, not a major feature, I would say. But the other thing is that you can, it helps a bit with logical replication. Um, there is some discussion, I guess, now in the community whether that's actually fail-safe or, or um, bulletproof. So there has been a so-called, well, okay, so the main problem with logical replication is that uh, if you do a stand, uh, if you do a failover or a switchover of the physical primary, then on the new primary there will be, the, the logical replication slot will not be in general be um, configured correctly and logical replication will break after a switch or failover. So what Petroni does it, uh, you can have to, you can configure um, a replication slot correctly and then it will advance the slot as, it, as it's being advanced on the primary as well. So in, in theory after a switch over then um, Rep logical replication should continue working. There is now actually a PG failover slot uh, extension, and the, the authors say that at least one of the problems that PG failover slots sir, um, um, solves is, is not being solved by Patroni. So there needs to be some integration here, which is pending, and hopefully it's better. And probably also Postgres 17 will have much better support for um, logical replication failover. So maybe that's just going to be integrated into, into Postgres and then, then this problem goes away. And then finally, there's some, some replica creation options. So basically, if there is no data at all in the beginning, Patroni will just run an init DB. It will bootstrap the leader, whoever won the leader race, and then the others will just run a PG-based backup. That's easy. But if you already have several terab terabytes of data, Oh, and by the way, you can also take over an existing cluster. Patroni is pretty gentle about it. Um, you don't even need to um, restart it, I believe. Um, and, and then that just works. But the problem then is if you need to reinitialize a standby, if there's some problems with the standby, you want to add another standby, and if there's already terabytes of data, then PG-based backup might not be the best tool for the job. 
So what you can do is you can also um, configure a specific replica creation method, and then in this case, PG backrest, but also a wall G um, from an S3 bucket or something um, would be an option. So you just restore a backup, and that means that there is no additional strain on the primary because with PG base backup, you have to sh um, ship the whole data from the primary to the new standby, and by this, you can go via the backup, which might be easier. And also, in this case, it does a delta restore, so if there was already some data there and you just want to basically rebuild it, um, PG backrest, for example, might be much faster in doing this because it only um, overrides the changed data and doesn't wipe the whole data directory and, and starts from scratch like PG base backup would. Okay. And then let's discuss some of the deployment topologies finally. So, in general, um, you can run Petroni in a single node setup, which might not make so much sense, but it might be useful if you have several Petroni clusters with the multiple nodes, and you have a couple of other single node instances, and you want to, you want to administrate them all in the same way. Um, so to have a yeah, dedicated and clear operation and not two things where you configure one node like this and the other Petroni nodes like that. But in general, otherwise, you can have up to N Petroni nodes. It's not really limited. Um, two node would be, of course, the minimal for high availability, and then three nodes are pretty typical, especially um, we'll see if, if the DCS is local. You need more than two nodes of DCS for anything else than a POC or a minimal viable whatever, because um, the DCS should not be a single point of failure. So uh, um, th there should be an odd number, so three, five, seven, and so on. Usually you would have three nodes. And then you can, there's the big question of should the DCS run locally on the Postgres and Petroni nodes, or should it run in its own cluster? And my advice usually is if there's already a etcd cluster or something, maybe not one who's part of Kubernetes, because that might not be the best way if you're not running Petroni in Kubernetes, then probably it's best to just use those console, Zookeeper, or etcd cluster, um, because the, the overhead is, is pretty small. And uh, also if you, if you have a lot of them, if you, if you decide to have more than a couple of Petroni clusters, then probably it makes sense to have a dedicated DCS cluster. Otherwise, maybe for simplicity, it might be useful to run the DCS locally. But then you should always consider that the DCS needs to have enough resources to do its job as well, and if the Postgres instance itself is overloaded, then that might take down the DCS and that might take down the cluster. And then again, that you could do it with a local raft, but that's deprecated. So that's how it would look like for a, for a OneNote setup with a dedicated DCS. You have, you have Petroni and, and Postgres as the leader, and Petroni talks to the DCS. Right, and with a second node, it just have the same, um, the, the, and you can then add more nodes as you want. Now, if you choose to run Petroni with a local DCS, it's, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to, to, run, um, to, to run a single node Petroni with a, with a DCS uh, cluster. But what you can do is you can run um, a two node Postgres, a Petroni cluster, and then the third node is just a quorum node. You just run the DCS on this. So it could be a much smaller VM, for example, if you, if you have those. But I think the most um, frequent one would be just the local th three node local DCS cluster because then everything is just the same. It's no, all of them are equal. I mean, if you have a lot of storage and you don't want to replicate all the storage to a third and you don't have um, other needs like synchronous replication, then of course maybe just use a two node cluster, but otherwise a three node cluster is, is, uh, is easiest for the really small ones. 
And then finally, you can have a, an internal DNS that's, that would be, uh, uh, sorry, DSCS, that would be the raft call, um, case where you just have three nodes. And then um, the other big question that we, we get asked always is like, okay, but can we run Petroni in, in multiple data centers? And that's possible. There's, there's basically two ways to do this. Then the main problem is if you have two data centers, usually the customer says, yeah, we, we have two data centers, we want, we want to run it. But the, main, the biggest problem with that is in order to um, have this quorum work right, you really need three um, data centers or three, uh, I don't know, availability zones or whatever. Um, and this is m often a problem then with, with the people and they, they cannot supply that. But you can basically run um, multi-region, multi-data center, multi-availability zone, whatever you want. There's two ways. You can either run a single Petroni cluster stretched over multiple data centers and then you have automatic failover and you can have synchronous replication if you want. Or you can run separate Petroni clusters and separate data centers. This you can also do with uh, two data centers, but this one should be three data centers if possible. But in this case, there would be only a manual failover, basically. Um, and, and you cannot have synchronous replication. Then this is both, uh, they are both uh, also explained in the Petroni documentation. Petroni documentation, maybe just to, to um, yeah, expand on that. I mean, the Postgres, Documentation is legendary good, I would say. It's, it's really good. It's, it's well, um, well, it could also always be improved, but it's in general considered to be really good for an open source project. The Petroni documentation isn't bad, but it's also not super great, I would say. It's unfortunate. But they uh, keep improving it as well. Right, so this, this part is, is pretty, it's actually pretty new, I think, so just check it out. Um, it, it's, it's pretty well explained there. Right, so the, the single Petroni cluster over multi-data centers would be a stretch. And um, you should always then keep in mind that latency might be a problem if it's too far away, if it's in different parts, uh, east, west coast, or whatever, um, that's not great. So there should be, I don't know, only maybe less than a couple dozen milliseconds or something of, of latency between the the clusters in order for it to work well. And um, you need um, three data centers if you want to have automatic failover. That's what I mentioned before. And you need at least one DCS node per data center, but um, you don't need to necessarily have a Petroni on the, on the third node, on the third data center, sorry. So it would look a bit like this. You have uh, three nodes. Um, in this case, well, you could still, this could be decoupled, of course. I mean, there could be a different node here if you want, then they don't need to be one node, but let's keep it a bit simple here. And these are the three data centers. So there's some synchronous replication in this case going on, and, and the DCS here. So, so either this would be uh, like three nodes for, for DCS and three nodes for Petroni, or just three nodes in, in total, depending again on how you want to set it up. And the, the other option would be the so-called standby cluster functionality. So that's uh, multiple Patroni clusters. They, they are then uh, distinct, um, two clusters. And um, each has their own DCS cluster. And the standby cluster leader replicates from the primary cluster. So basically, you have to configure this in the, in the standby cluster. Uh, in the second cluster, you have to configure uh, um, the host where it should um, replicate from. So either you can just put all the three or whoever, how many nodes there are in here, um, or just the client with the VIP if it's possible. And you need to then configure the, the slots, the replication slots correctly. So I would recommend to just have the, the slots set up for, for both on, on both sides and then primary slot name would be the one from the different, from the, from the other data center. I mean, this would be the, this would be the slot name that gets configured on the DCS, in the DC1 nodes. And failover then just works by, you run edit config and you remove the standby cluster. 
uh, just remove the three lines, save the config, and then automatically Patroni will say, oh, I'm no, no longer a standby cluster, I'm a real cluster, it promotes the leader, and then you have, um, you switched over. Um, if you run a real switch over, then you should first add the standby cluster to the, to the other, to the primary cluster, otherwise you have a split brain scenario. This is, um, there is no orchestration at, point, at this point, unfortunately, for this. There's no way, because there's two different Patroni clusters, there's no super Patroni control or something that could do this at this point. So either you have to switch it off first, or you have to make sure that it's a standby cluster first. It's a, it's a bit hairy, but in general it works pretty okay, and it would look like this. You have the first cluster, and then you have asynchronous replication. So, that, so the main point is that you only have one replication across the data centers, and the other standbys then do a cascading replication from the standby leader. Yes? Is there a solution where you can have multiple writers or multiple leaders? Um, no, not with Patroni in that sense, because that's generally a hard problem in Postgres space. I don't think there is a good presentation here about this. Um, I mean, Postgres is getting better at it. That's the multi-master, let's say, thing, and um, Postgres 16 already allows active-active replication, but there is a lot of caveats. You have to be very careful. Probably you need application support, um, because that only works with repli uh, logical replication and not physical replication that Patroni uses. So Patroni uses physical replication, which means that everything is the whole, basically it's a byte-by-byte -byte copy from the leader to the standbys or the followers. And then the follower can only run read queries on them via hot standby. And if you do logical replication, which Patroni kind of supports in a sense that it will help you with failovers, but it will not manage logical replication for you. But if you set that up, um, then you can, in principle, uh, write on both sides, but you get to keep both pieces if they break, and it's pretty easy to make it break still, unfortunately. And there is no DDL replication, sequences are not replicated, so it really needs either good DBA or good application support. So it's kind of an orthogonal problem to Petroni, I would say. And also, uh, I mean, this is the other part, I think there is no, I mean, maybe one or two, but there is no real good logical replication like management system or something for Postgres, like Petroni now does for physical replication. I think this is maybe um, a problem, or I don't know, somebody should write some some project that, that handles logical replication better. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Right, and just finally, not some words on, on DCS um, caveats and, and considerations. So the, the biggest one probably is the, the point um, that up until 2.0, so right now Patroni is at 3.2.1, I think, something like this. Uh, and while it was still on version 2, um, it, it was really reliant on DCS being available all the time. So every 10 seconds it would try to write to the DCS, and if the DCS was not available for, I don't know, a couple of seconds, um, it would demote the leader. And the cluster then is no longer writable, that's an application downtime. And that, was a, that was considered a big problem by a lot of people, and um, it does this, um, this thing, right? So uh, read timed out, cannot communicate with DCS, demoting self because DCS is not accessible, and I was a leader demoting. And then you have three standbys and no leader, and the application can no longer work. So this is especially always, or in, in my experience, big problem with etcd. Uh, if you, if you, uh, if etcd doesn't get, um, for example, if, if you run it on, on bad storage with VMware or something and you do a VM snapshot and then etcd is not able to write its, its state for one second because the snapshot takes all the resources, then the cluster would just fall over and, and we would frequently have these problems with, with customers um, that they have these uh, Patroni is falling over every day and it's not available and uh, it's a big problem. 
So what three version three brought mostly CITES support and the so-called DCS failsafe mode. And this is an additional um, key called failsafe. Um, it's pretty easy. You just have actually, the only thing you need to do is failsafe mode true. That's the whole configuration. You don't have to configure anything on the nodes or anything. You just add this to the cluster configuration and that's done. So basically what it does is if the leader cannot access the DCS, it will query all the other nodes and ask them, hey, what, are you still there and, and what's your state? And if they all answer back and say, yeah, I'm cool, I'm still following you, everything is fine, then will, the leader will continue working and he will ask them all the time. He will continue working even without DCS. So then these uh, outages of the DCS, there will be no failover or something during this. So it's kind of like a maintenance mode. But um, yeah, it gets error communication, then it gets a response from PG2 and PG3. And uh, it continues to run as a leader because face safe mode is enabled and all members are accessible. So there's also some documentation here. Um, so that's, that's a huge improvement, I think, in terms of usability of Petronium. And then the last point I want to make is some etcd considerations. I already mentioned it. You really need to give it the resources if you run etcd locally. I mean, if, if, the, if it's just for a small database and, and you don't expect it to have any kind of overload situation, then it's okay to not do too much. But if, if you really have a high performance database, then it might be that there are so many connections that it's, it's uh, CPU starved or IO starved, then you really need to give um, etcd the resources. Um, maybe, maybe also via C groups, uh, it's dedicated core, and certainly, if possible, a dedicated network interface and a de dedicated storage device, if possible. And also, one thing we noticed, um, it's, I haven't really tracked it down too, too much, but I think it's mostly etcd version 3. So everybody's running etcd version 3 now, but there's two versions of the API, the version 2 API and version 3 API, and they're pretty different. I mean, that's one thing, but okay, that's a different story. And if you're on the version 3 API, we've seen, maybe it's a thing how Petroni uses it, but we've seen that the, the um, transaction log of, of etcd can fill up. So it has like a two gigabyte quota, and if it fills up, then it basically not, it's not working anymore. And so you have to switch on auto compaction retention um, to some value, either with the environment variable or with this option in order to not run into this problem, just so you know. And that's it. Are there any other questions? Yes. Well, you should not limit etcd. You should give it enough resources, first of all. But what happens if etcd shuts down? Yes, I mean, if you don't have failsafe mode activated, then usually that means that there is no longer an etcd quorum. There is no leader. And Patroni will not get the reads out of or the writes into etcd. And if there is no failsafe models, then Patroni will demote, is my understanding of the situation. Yes, I think if, I mean, etcd doesn't need a lot of resources, so you can go with three small VMs. And I think that makes sense, especially if you plan to have more than one or two Petroni clusters, then it's just like three VMs where there's nine or six, I mean, the additional cost is negligible, and um, it just makes it easier, I would say, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. So the question is uh, security. Um, Rep manager needs SSH. Um, well, security in the terms of data security or uh, compromises. So you don't need SSH. Um, Petroni, Petroni communicates with each other over 
the REST API. The REST API can be secured by TLS and, and the client certificates if you want. Um, and also, the, you can, you can um, secure the, the communication to DCS with TLS. And, and then additionally, also with uh, passwords if you want. And then you can have a user for, for the DCS, depends a bit. Um, right, uh, so that's the main thing. It doesn't use SSH. It might use the Postgres protocol to talk to the other Postgres instances, not just the local one, but to the other ones. That means, but it doesn't need, in general, and, and we make sure, it doesn't need a super user connection to the other hosts. Um, it just needs a replication connection to the other hosts, or it needs a PG Rewind, uh, PG Rewind user that can use. But you can, you can um, configure a PG Rewind that's, that's rewinding an old primary in a sense that it doesn't need a super user. Yeah, you just have to grant it the right functions, and um, Petroni can do that itself if you, uh, on, on Bootstrap. Does it answer your question? It does. What's Well, we haven't seen any incidents um, because, yeah, I mean, we can maybe discuss it later. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what your problem with Red Manager was, but in the sense that, yeah, no, I'm, I haven't really seen it. Um, certainly, it, it's, it's a bit involved, or more involved if you really want to use it. To do, you should have TLS everywhere, and then that makes configuration more difficult, let's say, but otherwise, it's okay, and there's also there's a couple of read-only uh, REST uh, calls uh, for for Postgres, and you can also um, make it so that the ones like failover or configuration change, they need to actually supply a password, username, password on the REST call, REST API call, um, so that it's not so easy to abuse, even if you require TLS. Any other final questions? I think we're running out of time. Yeah. The data, yes, the, anything below the instance, you would use Postgres. Um, the only thing is that Petroni starts and stops Postgres. It doesn't like if you stop it yourself, but that's kind of like a DBA thing. But you connect to Postgres, you create the database, that's automatically replicated. You do all the changes, schemas, users. Postgres, Petroni, you can configure to create databases, I think, and maybe users, but it's not necessary. I mean, the only thing it really wants to do is create possibly a rewind user and a, a replication user for that initially. But everything else, um, that's up to you, yes. Any final question? Yeah. Let's say that I run Petroni in a three month situation. And I have one primary focus of the replicas. And I decided to use their client side code. Yeah. Like this? OK, yeah. Yeah, and then let's say that one of the, 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 the primary goes down. Yeah. How quickly this error will be propagated to the client? Like, what's going to be my coverage from the client portfolio? Well, usually what the client would do is the next time the client tries to run a command, an SQL command over the connection, or start a new connection, it will get an error from, I mean, if it starts a new connection, then it's not a problem because uh, it would automatically see this is no longer the primary, um, and then it would um, it would uh, try the next one uh, and until and if it's still connected, I think it would just get the next time it tries to run a command, it would get narrow back uh, that the connection is closed or whatever, and and it would fall over. I think it's in general okay, quick, but I'm not 100 percent sure what happens if there is a timeout, like how much timeout there is if, if the leader is still there, but actually not, not really responding in the sense that the port is still available. I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure how that would work. Right, OK, sure, yes. I mean, Patroni will, um, well, 
um, Patroni, there is this time to live. And if, um, I mean, I can, the, the failover, I think it's 30 seconds for the time to live, and you can configure it yourself. If you want to tighten up the, the timeouts, then you can certainly do this. Um, but once the time to live is up, it depends a bit when was the last loop and everything, then there will be a new leader election. So you can configure it this way if you need it in 10 seconds then you can do it, but that, again, that means if it's very tight, it could be that there is a false positive and it does a failover even though the other one is just a bit behind, right? Okay. So thanks, everybody. Um, we're out of time. So, uh, yeah, thank you. If you have any further questions, I'm still here tomorrow.